Welcome to the Vertical Go-To-Market Podcast, where you'll discover new opportunities to grow your business from seven figures to eight from the world's most successful agency and B2B SaaS executives. I'm your host, Corey Quinn. Let's jump into the show. Today, I'm joined by the visionary behind Contractor Dynamics, Joseph Hughes. What's going on, Joseph? A lot. I want to say not much. There's always a lot going on. Uh, great to be here. I'm yeah. excited. I love your enthusiasm for this. So I'm excited to dig in here. Me too, Joseph. I have so much interest in your background and the work you do. I used to be at an agency that targeted the trades, including roofers. And so I have a sense of what you do and I can't wait to, to dig in. As I mentioned, you're the, you're the visionary, the founder behind Contractor Dynamics. Could you just introduce for the for the listening audience, could you just introduce a little bit about you, your background, and then a little bit, a little bit about your company? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. So I'll start with present and kind of work backward a little bit. If that's cool. So Contractor Dynamics, we are a marketing training company, and we work specifically with roofing companies in North America. So pretty niche in terms of our service. We are a marketing training company, so we're not providing websites and advertising services to our clients. We are an education company. We train our clients on how to build and run their own marketing in-house. So that's a niche there. And then we focus 100% on roofing companies. It might sound a little bit, maybe a small market for those of you who are not in construction. It is a gigantic industry, the roofing industry. So we can talk more about that, but that's what we focus on. Been doing this, we started back in 2013. So about 10 and a half years. And I grew up in my family's construction business here in New Jersey and New York City. Uh, started there when I was 14, working out in the field, working out in a shipyard, blue collar, worked my way into the office and uh, learned a lot about small business and all the different parts of small business and uh, just kind of got obsessed with that. And uh, I, left the, I left the family biz, which is called Hughes Marine Firms. It's a hundred and uh, they started in 1894. So they're a hundred and what, 29 years old or wow. something like that? Something crazy. Yeah. So I left the family biz. It was awesome. I just really had this itch to uh, go out on my own and just kind of, you know, see what I could do out there and make a dent in the world as we entrepreneurs like to do. So yeah, that's uh, the construction background. It's in my blood. I love marketing. I love business. I love helping people above everything else. So uh, that's how that all came about. Beautiful. Now, I believe you have, uh, you have children, you have uh, small children. Yeah, sorry. I focus so much on the no, business. No, no. The re- there's a reason why I asked that. I'm interrupt you. So you mentioned that you left the family business. There's a movie that my son and I just watched last night, a Disney movie called Elemental. Have you had a chance to see that? I have not. Okay. No. It, the the storyline is, is the relationship between a child and their family, and she wants to leave the family business. So sorry. I just watched that movie wow. last night. It's very good, by the way. How was that? Just a total tangent, but how was that? Was there a lot of pressure to stay in the family business or was that fairly, you know, less, not, not that much friction getting out? Yeah. The family dynamic, I'm sure there's a lot of family, uh, you know, family business people maybe listening to this, tuning into this very common and it ended up being pressure only from me. So it's one of those deals where, you know, I grew up in the business. It's like kind of like the mafia. Like once you get in, you don't leave. And just because it's, it, it was good. It was like, you know, a comfortable living. It wasn't baller money, but it was good money, company car, health benefits, you know, the whole deal. Right. So job security, working for a 120 something year old business, job security in every sense of the word. And yeah, so that was just a thing that I built up internally over a couple of years. And, you know, over the, the, the six months leading up to my conversation with my, my dad, my dad and my, my two uncles were the owners. And I remember it like clear as day. It was the day after Thanksgiving, 2011. I'm in my parents' kitchen because I'm like home for Thanksgiving. And like, I'm like sweating. I'm like probably stuttering. I probably like was white and everything. I was so, just so nervous because, you know, I didn't want to seem ungrateful for the opportunity, but I had to live my life. And so yeah, I kind of blurted it out. And at the end of the day, like I didn't have kids at the time, but now that I do, I realize, you know, my parents just want me to be, you know, they want me to have a roof over my head, no pun intended. They want me to be happy with my own family and, and that's that. So I'm grateful to have that opportunity with the family biz. I learned a ton. Grateful to have parents that are understanding that are like, yeah, do you know, we'll support you in whatever you want to do and cheer you on and all that good stuff. And also the other thing, Corey, is that like I was not the 
I'm not the end of the line for my family. So it's not like, not like me leaving was, was stopping like a hundred year old run. I have four cousins that are my generation, the sixth generation in the family biz right now. So it'll continue on. If I was that last draw, I don't, I don't think I could have had, could have done that. So luckily I didn't need to make that decision. That would have been a tough, tough one. Wow. What an amazing story. And it sounds like you leveraged a lot of, like you said, a lot of the experience working in more of a blue collar situation and seeing how small businesses run. And now you're leveraging that in your own business as an entrepreneur. Amazing. That's really cool. What could you share just for context about contractor dynamics as far as maybe the size of the business, number of employees, revenue, anything you're comfortable sharing? Yeah. So we are, let's see, there's 12, 12 team members. And I don't like the word employees. I think we're all part of a team. We follow the EOS structure. So we have a lot of, we're very systematic in the way we operate. We work with roofing companies throughout North America of all shapes and sizes. And currently we're around 60, 60 clients. And yeah, our our flagship program is a 12 month marketing training program. So we work with our clients for at least a year. Ideally, we'd like to get them, you know, into our ecosystem and work with them for two to three years on a variety of different things. But yeah, that's kind of a, you know, snapshot of the biz. Sure. I don't, I don't generally like to, you know, share revenue numbers and all that. So that's okay. That's hundred percent fine. What is your role there as the visionary? To cast the vision of the company, we are, you know, we're still small. So it's not like I'm just sitting here, like, you know, meditating and, you know, thinking about the vision and all that. Like, I'm in the business a lot. So I'm the visionary driving the, the the direction of the company. And I also sit in the marketing seat. So I'm the head of marketing. So that's that's what I do for the majority of my hours in any given week is, is working on building and running our marketing. And then we have Elizabeth, our integrator. She also sits in the finance seat and the sales seat. And then we have a couple other people in leadership positions. But mostly what I'm doing is, you know, culture, core values. We have a team meeting every Monday that Elizabeth and I take turns leading, coaching our team members to help them level up, whether it might be like, you know, time management or, you know, things like that. And then, like I said, a lot of it is really focused on marketing. Let's talk about the origin of your business. So you started, as you mentioned, 2013, you've been around for about 10 and a half years. What was happening in your life about 2013? You mentioned 2011 is when you you had that discussion across the the breakfast table, if you will, with your folks. Then in 2013, it sounds like this was when you started the company. About you know plus or minus, what was happening in your life? What what, what was the the sort of the lead up to starting the business? Man, I I had you know I had a business plan on paper. And uh, we all know how those go. You know, that's that's worth nothing until you go out there in the market and get kicked in the teeth a little bit. So I had this business plan. I, I, I knew I was, uh, I wanted to do marketing. I just saw, I, I had a passion. I still have a passion for it. I saw the gap in the industry in terms of like contracting and marketing. And, you know, another thing is about marketing with, with the construction industry is like, you know, small hinges swing big doors. So you can make a few little tweaks to a company Companies marketing and because construction projects are generally high ticket, like that can make a massive difference in a company. So I was excited about that. And the way that I started out, Corey, is locally here at the Jersey Shore. I started a Facebook group and I started a local a networking group of contractors. And you know, I, I started going to these like chamber of commerce uh, meetings and BNI and everything like that. I know those things can be awesome. I did. I did not personally enjoy that. And I did not find that a valuable use of time because I was so focused on contractors. And so I said, you know, instead of trying to get a seat at the table, let me build my own table. And I started this networking group, Jersey Shore Contractors. I started hosting uh, coffee meetups. So it's like every Friday at Green Planet Coffee Shop in Point Pleasant, New Jersey, we're going to meet at 7 a.m. Coffee and, you know, donuts, bagels are on me. And we'll just kind of meet up and network. And, you know, we had people come and you'd have like, you know, the remodeling contractor meeting up with the architect and they were chatting about a project, the, you know, the pool builder, landscape guy, like everyone was kind of forming these relationships. And I was at the center of it. This is kind of before I even knew what the heck I was selling. And the first couple guys came up to me at, at this event. One guy's name was Neil and another guy, Nick. And they both were like, Hey, like, so what do you do? How can you help us? And I was like, well, I, I don't know. Like, what do you need? And it was really like that, that raw. And, and so, you know, it was hey, a website, it was SEO, it was some other marketing that we ended up doing for those guys. 
And that was the genesis of it. So that was that was the start of it. I I had a I'm not a like a web developer or anything like that. I built websites I, over the you know over the years, but I hired a uh, full time web developer in the Philippines. His name is Ju, and like it was me and Ju, man. I would I would like you know talk with the clients during the day. I'd be sitting at my kitchen table with my laptop at night because you know Philippines are like 12 hours ahead of me. And just, you know, just knocking it out, slamming coffee and just making it happen. And I would not recommend this, but within like a four month period, we, I started this business, we had our first child and we moved homes, like three big events within a four month period. I would not recommend that, but looking back on it, you know, what doesn't kill you makes it stronger. So yeah. I feel like that was, uh, you know, helped me kind of just, you know, develop some grit. So that was the genesis of it. That's amazing. So you weren't getting what you wanted out of the BNI because you were focused on contractors. How did you know that, that contractors was the market you wanted to focus on? Just from growing up in the industry, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's in my blood. Literally, it's my first job when I was 14, working in a shipyard in Brooklyn, New York. And um, yeah, just coming from a, a humble, you know, family, we, you know, as a family growing up, like, you know, we did, my parents did well and went to private high school and college and all that stuff, but like still very humble. And I love that aspect of, of construction, like the humility, the fact that like you can put in a hard day's work and, and build something and create something. So yeah, I just always knew that like I wanted to be a part of that, uh, something like tangible, yeah. you know? So I, I actually have a finance degree from college. I, I sold municipal bonds right out of college for, the, for a few years and before I went into the family biz. And I hated it because it was just like, you know, just numbers and papers and it wasn't like anything tangible really. At the end of the day it is, but it wasn't like immediately tangible to me. So I like that tangible aspect of construction. That's awesome. So it was clear that you wanted to lean into that, uh, that vertical specialization. You have all that history and that connection. You started your own group on Facebook. I love that fact that you did that super smart. And then you just were helpful. You asked like, you know, what do you need? People needed websites and then you made it, made it happen. So at what point did you become a training company or you were started off sounding like, you know, you were doing more marketing services and then, and then it evolved into training and then, and then where do roofers come into uh, play? Yeah, sure. So it was very organic. It was uh, we were a marketing agency. We built up a full agency for seven years, 2013 through 19 and, you know, building websites, running ads, blogging, doing all those things. And then it was about 2018. I had a partner at the time. His name's Tim. I since bought him out. So I'm back to being 100% owner the last couple of years. But Tim and I were like, man, you know, we have these, we have a bunch of clients that are paying us every month and they are doing really well. They're getting great results. And then we have these other clients that are paying us every month and like they're not really doing that well. And we're like, what's like the common, you're always looking for patterns, right? Like what's working, what's not working. And so the clients that were doing well, where the contracting companies like all over the country, so we're working virtually with everyone, of course, that are involved in their marketing. Like they care about it, they're interested in it, they're, you know, showing up to their their monthly meetings with us, they're, you know, emailing us back when we send a reporting every Friday. If we ask for videos or photos, like they're sending us content. We had a couple guys even fly out to our office in New Jersey to sit down to kind of build out their annual marketing plan. So those guys were doing great. And then there's other contractors that like didn't understand marketing and they just wanted to pay us to make their phone ring. And back in like 2015, 16, 17, like that was pretty easy. Like we could run Facebook ads for a roofing company in Dallas and kill it. Like it was pretty easy. Then you started getting you know, just more and more companies on social media, more contracting companies in social media, more noise out there and more competition for the ad dollars. And we saw the necessity for, for contracting companies to like be creating their own content and sharing videos and differentiating. And that's still a big question. Like how do I differentiate in a crowded market? Well, like video content. So we started developing some training to help our clients basically be better clients. Like, hey, Brett, one of our clients at the time, we want you to do this video. Like Brett had no clue what the heck we were talking about. So here's a little bit of training on how to do that. We put it inside, I believe Kajabi at the time. And like, here's some training videos on how to do what we're telling you to do. And then in 2019, we decided to try out like a pilot uh, training program. So it was May 2019. And I said to, uh, you know, we, we mapped out like a, what was it? A six week, it was a six week program. 
looking back on it, way too short. But anyway, it's a six week program. <laughs> And Earth was a 10 week. It was somewhere it was six weeks. And I went out to six roofing company owners that I knew pretty well. I was like, hey, we're gonna try this thing. If you want to learn how to do some of this stuff yourself, we're gonna try this thing. We're gonna start in May. We're gonna meet every Wednesday at 3:30. We're gonna meet on Zoom and we're gonna, you know, kind of build this out as we go along. You're gonna be a guinea pig. You're gonna pay a discounted rate, but like we're gonna build this thing as we go based on your feedback. So we did that in May, June of 2019, got some good feedback, and then we uh, developed it into a full-blown training program and launched it on January 1st, 2020. So <laughs> we flipped the switch Jan 1st, 2020, and I've never looked back. So yeah, man, three and a half years of training mm -hmm. and just uh, still feel like we're, we just kind of like, we reinvented the business. You know, we, we, we shed our clients, we, you know, shed team members. We almost like, in a sense, started as a new startup, but with a lot of experience. So that was pretty cool. So many questions I have. This is, this is fascinating yeah. because I think you've been able to successfully transition from an agency to a training company, obviously. And that, that's a, that's a very difficult thing to do. I also find it interesting. You did it on January, in January, 2020, right before the pandemic. I'm sure that was potentially a really good move from a timing perspective. It was interesting. Yeah. Obviously no one knew that was coming in you know, March. But that was fortuitous for our business. It was, you know, you had these, you had these contractors that were like knocking doors, literally, as you know, like a lot of roofing companies will, will knock doors and, and they weren't able to do that. So it's like, well, I need to be able to get in touch with people digitally. So yeah. that was, that was a pretty good, yeah. you know, little boost for the business for sure. So, and then besides yeah. that, just the trend of like, Hey, you know, that's how consumers make decisions these days. Like we're looking online, like social media, just, you know, all of that's just been a, you know, giant movement. What for the six week program itself, what was the curriculum? Like what was the focus of that original program? Man, that'd be uh, I'd have to dig that up. I think we still have like remnants of it now. So like our five pillars right now, which I think that they've evolved, but the five pillars we have right now are foundation. So understanding, like getting clarity on your business, your goals, your ideal clients, your ideal projects. Second pillar is, uh, is content. So creating content to actually like get the attention of your ideal prospective clients and team members. Third is distribution. So getting your content out in front of people. So social media ads at that, at that time, now we focus on a lot more, but at that time, social media ads, Facebook ads. Number four was optimization, like learning how to like look at the data to see what's working, what's not. So, so like a, like a roofing company owner can like, you know, go in ads manager and, and make some adjustments and things like that. And then number five sales. So having a, a lead handling system, a follow-up system, long-term nurture system. So those were the five pillars that we still use today. We've elaborated on all of those, but, uh, I think that was it. Yeah. That's uh, that curriculum sounds awesome because it's not just like tactical, like, you know, here's a Facebook ad. You're more talking about more strategy. Like, you know, who is our, who's our ideal customer and, and, you know, how do we want to position ourselves and talking about content, all those really important things that are, are difficult potentially to, to train on, but are very, to your point, like a, it's a big lever. Yeah. Yeah. Most companies like, you know, whether you like, whether they've tried to say, say, Facebook ads on their own, or they've hired like a, a, a guy or an agency. Usually they start at pillar, like step number three, which is distribution. Like you yeah. said, like yeah. let's, let's boost this post or let's like, you know, let's run this ad and see what happens in that spray and pray marketing. Yeah. And you know, yeah. that doesn't work. So it's like, Hey, let's back up. Let's like, look at the big picture picture here. Let's get clarity. Let's start with the end in mind and then like go from there. So that's still today. Like that's the first exercise we go through with a new client is like, our marketing strategy worksheet it's like that that foundational piece and a lot of companies even today are like man like this is such a great exercise like I've, we've never done this before like this is awesome yeah like, yeah. yeah it's a ton, yeah. Of, a ton of value there and how did you come to roofers specifically i know you mentioned that of your agency clients you had some that were much more engaged and responsive and kind of hands-on and others not so much was that where you kind of refined it to roofers or you know, where did roofing come in specifically Yes, it was very like serendipitous and it goes back to the one of the guys at that first meetup, Nick, Nick Forcell, owned a contracting company here by me at the Jersey Shore and became, you know, client number one or two back in the day after those meetups I had. 
Nick moved to Dallas, Texas with his family in 2017 and focused on roofing because uh, roofing's big, big in Texas. And he calls me and he's like, dude, you got to like come down here. There's like this, this like, it was a lunch and learn, like literally a lunch and learn for roofing contractors in Dallas, August, 2017. He's like, come down, I'll introduce you to the guys running it. I'll introduce you to, uh, you know, my buddies in the roofing industry. So literally got on a plane that morning. I mean, he gave me a heads up, but like I flew down and back from Jersey to Dallas in the same day, flew down, went to lunch and learn, flew back that night. I was in my bed that night, but I met a lot of people there, got exposed to the roofing industry and got talking with Nick. I'm like, man, this is like a gigantic industry. I had no idea. And it's very like entrepreneurial. It's very scalable. So whereas like a remodeling company, you know, your typical like mom and pop remodeling company, in my experience anyway, you know, they don't like to take on too much work because they like to be involved in, you know, checking on their jobs and, you know, making selections with a homeowner. And generally that that's a very like more of a complex business that is not as scalable. Uh, granted, there are some big remodeling companies for sure, but like with roofing, it's more like, Hey, you're, you know, we're replacing your roof in a day. You know, we have some clients that do 30, 40, 50 roofs a week, very scalable. That's like, amazing. and we found like that a lot of the owners were around my age, you know, building businesses, growing families, trying to like do it all, very entrepreneurial. And I really latched on to that. And, you know, back to the thing I said, like about BNI and, and the Chambers of Commerce and things like that, those meet, those like events were full of like, you know, old people that I didn't really want to like hang out with at the time. And like, you know, roofing was like, oh, like you guys are like my age, we're like pretty much the same. We're, we're building service businesses. Mine's marketing, yours is roofing. But other than that, it's pretty much the same. And so, yeah, that was that. So we're like, you know what? Let's just go all in with roofing. And uh, for the next couple of years, this is back in 2018. And we've been hanging out here ever since. And we will through 2025. That's our plan. We might expand after that. We might not. I don't know. But it's it's that big. Yeah. <laughs> so why 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 is that important for a business owner to such as yourself to instead of go from, let's say, construction or even home services, which is you're arguably a subset of construction. You went to the next level, which is a sub sub set of construction. Like what, why was that important for you strategically? For marketing our business, two reasons, marketing our business, it's, it's easier to like focus on one niche, like on one trade. Right. So like, for example, going to conferences, we're going to three conferences coming up over the next few months. We're hosting our own two of our own events over the next two months. That's all roofing specific. Like there's no way as a small company, we could be going to like the roofing conferences and then the HVAC and then the remodeling and the landscaping. Like, like there's no way we could have done that. So this way we're able to like laser focus on like going to all the conferences and the roofing. And we've been fortunate enough to get on stage at some of them and even win awards at a couple of them. And so that's been, you know, just a way to like really strengthen the brand and like become like, you know, it's still, it's still a big pond, but like, you know, a noticeable fish in a big pond. I won't say a big fish in a small pond, but a notice, you know, become more noticeable. So that's number one reason for us selfishly. And then the other reason is for our clients. So when our clients come into our training program, like we have a whole online portal, we have a couple dozen call, like group calls and one-on-one -on -one calls every week. Everything is roofing specific. So they're able to come in and like we're speaking their language. We have like kind of ready to go, you know, ad templates and video scripts and, you know, marketing strategies ready for them to kind of like you know, use and kind of take, you know, make their own spin on, but it's like, they appreciate that because we speak their language. So, and then when we get on our group calls, it's, you know, it's roofing company marketing managers, or today we had a two hour call with our, with six roofing company owners, and they're all talking about the same issues. And they're all talking about, you know, the, the same things, the same language. And that's just so valuable, yeah. you know, cause they're, they're in a group with their people. So just that's for those two reasons. It's been, it's been awesome. Hey, it's Corey. Almost every day I talk with agency owners who are frustrated with getting their outbound program off the ground. The truth is too many agencies are too dependent on inbounds and referrals to grow their business. We all know that it's getting harder and harder to generate inbounds and that it's just not a sustainable way to grow your business. 
I'd like to give you the six secrets for driving consistent ROI from your outbound that I learned as Scorpion's chief marketing officer, where we doubled the business from 20 million to 40 million just by adding outbound to an existing inbound only program. It's a free six day email course that will transform your outbound from broken to consistently driving new sales opportunities. You could sign up and get the first secret right now by going to getoutboundroi.com. That's getoutboundroi.com. Now back to the show. My experience, I actually, we did, set, we did target roofers for a period of time at my last company, Scorpion. And uh, we, what I found just in home services in general and across service businesses is that majority of the businesses that we attracted at that time when I was there were companies that were looking for more of a done for you type of approach, meaning that they were not that interested in getting involved in marketing. They kind of just saw it as a thing that is sort of a necessary evil in some respects, you know, that's something they had to deal with, but they didn't really care mm -hmm. to get involved in and kind of own. They were looking for a partner. But clearly you, the market that you target and you work with within roofers are those business owners that actually are seeking to be trained and build some in-house expertise. How, what does that dynamic look like for you? And like, what, is there a correlation between the size of the, the roofing business or like how, to, at what point does a, a roofer or a home service business go from, Hey, I want to outsource this to, Hey, I want to find a great partner to train us so that we can be elite. Yeah, great questions. It's been a journey, Corey. I think a few years ago, like for the past few years, at, at points, we 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 kind of like thought and sat around like as a team and thought that like in some ways we were early to the market because you know roofing is a very it's I don't know they say it's you you might know because you have experience working with more types of trades than I do but you know a few years behind like HVAC for example or home services right so in terms of like sophistication innovation software CRMs like you name it so I mean 2023 like we've worked with a couple of clients this year who like we helped them get their get into their first CRM like <laughs> mind blowing anyway so we thought we were kind of early to where you know we're offering marketing training and our market doesn't even know that that is a thing or what that is so that's why like we focus so much on education our podcasts our youtube like a ton of social media content i think most most people will probably think we're a much bigger company than we are because we put out so much content but now like we've seen the shift like this year and we just talked about in our leadership meeting on monday we've seen a shift and we're attracting more of those those companies that are like no i don't want it done for me i want to build my brand and i want to learn how to do it in house and some of that is is just strictly like mindset you know maybe younger roofing company owners they understand like brand they understand marketing they understand social media and the value of it they might not understand like the the nuances of it which is why you know they're paying us to train them but they understand the importance of it so that's that's one thing in that regard no it doesn't it doesn't matter what the company size is you know we have clients that are that are you know they hit their first million dollar year this year or they're going for it we have clients that are striving for 100 million this year so it really is just a mindset thing and a lot of it comes down to the pain point the pain point of hey i've been in business a few years i've tried you know one two three five seven marketing agencies i've wasted so much money i haven't gotten results i feel stupid because i just keep getting taken advantage of and i the pain is so bad that i want to learn it myself yeah that has been we've seen we felt that shift this year so like we know that man the roofing industry like most companies still don't care about marketing and those that do you know only I don't know, a handful, 3% of the companies that care about marketing want marketing training. So we, we work really hard to find our people, but when we do, man, it's awesome. It's just like, it's just like, like, let's get married today. You know, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. I, I think it's super interesting. That all makes perfect sense. And I think, gosh, there's probably, well, I'll back up. I think there's a, a number of agencies that are truly, really good in the, in the in any space, but they struggle to stand out because there is so much noise in the agency market where a lot of these clients are trying to attract have are somewhat jaded because they've had a poor experience like over and over and over again. What I what I think you're what I'm hearing you do is you're doing something different. You're not better than the other agency. You're doing a different approach. It's almost like a category play a little bit, right? Where 
uh-huh. it's it's an opportunity to tell them, hey, you may not be think you don't realize it, but there's a different way to you know solve this problem that you're trying to that you're struggling with. It's not going and hiring another agency. There's there's a different way, and by the way, it's a, probably a better way potentially, right? Depends on how you frame it. But that's that's super interesting opportunity for you guys. Yeah, that's intentional. It's the Russell Brunson like new vehicle. Right. So like uh, you know, hey, you've been in this vehicle trying to achieve this result. Here's a new vehicle to, to achieve the same thing, or you can use like red ocean, blue ocean, whatever. But yeah. Shoot, I was going to say something else on that, but I forget. Yeah, I well, well, there, yeah, which is which is why it's brilliant that you are doing a lot of content because part of that is helping to solve their problems with the content through the podcast and YouTube and these other things. Did you get your thought? I did get my thought. You could tell, right? <laughs> so I do want to. I, I do want to. I mean, I don't know how important this might be to the sure. episode, but most of our clients that we train, they still work with agencies. Like they still work outside agencies. The mm. difference is that the clients that were like our clients understand how to collaboratively work with those agencies, how to hold them accountable and that sort of thing. So they have more successful relationships. So like, for example, like we'll train our clients on how to do all those five pillars, run their social media ads. But there are things like, you know, websites, SEO, Google ads, pretty complex, pretty technical things that most of our clients don't do in house that we recommend that they find an agency for. Sure, we have recommendations that we can make, right? but they are able to say like, hey agency, where's my report? Where's my results? No, I'm not taking, we're tweaking things in the back end for an answer or, hey, we gotta wait till the algorithm kicks in for an answer, like they're, they're holding them accountable and getting better results or, you know, getting rid of them and, you know, running it themselves. So I, I wanted to clarify that we're, we're not like anti-agency at all. It, a lot of our clients do both. Uh, that's that's awesome, and I think it, a byproduct of that is you're probably making them better agency clients because yeah, the the agency would probably prefer, at least in my experience, prefer to work with more sophisticated client who could be more clear about exactly what they want and you know have input uh-huh. into into the work they're doing versus having it all be a, a, on the agency to come up with it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That's wow. That's that's super interesting. And then- uh, flip side, I, some agencies probably don't like us because we and we uh, educate <laughs> our clients on how to, you know, how to understand what they're getting or not getting. So yeah, yeah, that's good though. I think that's good. So along the path here, you've been you've been at it for for ten plus years. First seven years were at agency, then you transitioned to this this training program and and this this service where you're helping to to train these these roofers. What are some of the common challenges? or the typical challenges or some of the challenges you've, you've faced along the way. And I'll, I'll actually ask about one specifically, at what point did this concept of delegating and elevating become a priority for you? Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, challenges every day. I I wrote a post earlier this week. It might've been over the weekend, but every day I feel like I get more successful. I face more challenges and there's a third thing. But it's you know it comes with the territory of, of growth. So yeah, delegating and elevating is an EOS term. Are you familiar with EOS? Yes, generally. All right. So we follow EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System, EOSWorldwide.com. Basically, an operating system for running your business, where you have the right people in the right seats, roles and responsibilities, annual planning, quarterly meetings, weekly meetings. For someone that's like a high S personality, like structure, stability, consistency, it plays really well into like my personality and our team loves it as well. So yeah, one of the tools, the EOS tools is called delegate and elevate. So as an owner, like for so many years, it was the Joe show. Like, yeah, we had, we had employees, but it was more like, you know, I'm the bottleneck for everything. I am telling people what to do, not like a dictatorial way, but like telling people what to do and they're doing it, come back to me. All right, what's next? What do I do? And it's like, that's a typical like owner employee kind of relationship. I've done that too. So I know exactly what that's like. Yeah. And then like, you just, you get to the point, you hit the, you know, Dan Martell calls it the pain wall. Like you get to this wall where like, it's so painful. I got to do something to change because I feel burnt out or I can't go any further. I reached the ceiling. And so EOS enables you to delegate, not like I'm not delegating a task, like, Hey, Casey, do this thing. It's delegating the the outcome or the responsibility. So like Elizabeth is in charge of like the, you know, she, our our finances, she's in charge of our sales. So like the entire departments are delegated so I can elevate into that visionary seat and kind of zoom out and focus on like, Hey, you know, where are we going over the next three years? In which ways do we see like the market shifting? Like, 
in which ways do our clients need more support from us or maybe need help in different areas. So things like that. Mm -hmm. But unless you're able to like delegate and truly delegate and not micromanage, you're not going to be able to elevate to like, you know, people call it working on the business, not working in the business. I still do a lot of both, but that's the only way in my experience that you're able to, to grow. So that's been a really good tool for us. Yeah. And it doesn't come naturally to me because I'm a, a blue collar, grew up like, hey, if something needs to get done, I'm going to do it, right? I'm just going to figure out, I'll get it done. If I have to, I'll, I'll make some coffee and I'll, I'll just plow through it. So it doesn't come naturally to me. So Elizabeth is our COO, my right hand. And I've said to her multiple times, like, hey, call me out if you feel that I'm not delegating something because of old habit yeah. or whatever. So we have this open, like, you know, dialogue like that. So that's a great, that's a great asset to have someone who can call you out on your blind spots. We all have them, right? Yes. Yeah. You know, what, at what point did the, you mentioned Dan Martell's, uh, you said it was a pain wall. Is yeah, that, yeah. Pain wall. The pain, I mean, I pain something like that. Yeah. yeah. I, at what point did you, was the pain wall just too intense that like, I, I, as far as along the journey in the 10 ish years, when did you bring in EOS? When did you start to address some of these things? EOS was about a year and a half ago. Okay. So like May, 2022. And yeah, it was like working, you know, working my butt off and feeling like, you know, we weren't, we weren't growing kind of like, you know, you ever had that, the feeling like you're on the hamster wheel and like, you know, there are things that you want to do and, and ways that you might want to grow, but you're just so in the weeds that it's hard to like pick your head up and, and, you know, look ahead. And it was just being at the point, like our kids are 11 and eight. Like, I don't want to work. I, I like to work. I love it. I don't want to work more hours. I want to work less hours. Yeah. So it's like, how can we achieve more and grow more and hire more people with Joe working, you know, fewer hours and being present for my family and, you know, being able to go on vacations or whatever it might be. So that was a big part of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a huge part of it. Realizing like I'm capping myself at the number of hours I I'm going to work per week. So like we need to find leverage somewhere. Yeah, that's awesome. What impact has joining mastermind groups and having business coaches? What what how has that impacted your growth as a founder and a leader in your company? Uh, it's been everything, man. Yeah, for the first couple of years, three years, I thought somehow my business model was unique, like marketing for contractors, like. I thought it was kind of you. Now this is before I'm probably sounding old, but before social media was like really like a big thing. So like we weren't as connected to people like you and I would not necessarily be able to connect like this 10 years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, I didn't, I didn't know that there, it wasn't like a, I thought it was a very unique business. So I thought I had to figure out everything on my own. So that's part ignorance and part just, again, my blue collar work ethic where it's like, no, I want to figure it out. Right. And then it was 2015. I joined my first like online forum mastermind. And through that, I found a business coach. His name is Tim Conley. So I was in his group coaching program for a couple of years. And that was like, man, Tim, Tim's 10 years older than me. He had run a marketing agency, maybe two had sold one of them. So we'd been there and done that. And I was like, holy cow, like, like Tim knows like what's going on in my head. He knows the challenges. He's been there and done that. Like he can help guide me. So that was an eye opener. And then that was 2015. So ever since then, like fast forward, you know, eight years, I still have a business coach, not him, but another one. And it's just, you know, I have, a, I have a business coach that I pay. I'm a member of a couple of mastermind groups. I have, a, you know, I call my inner circle. So like peer mentors who are friends who are business owners as well in different industries that, you know, when I need to make a big decision or something like that, you know, maybe I'll consult them. And, you know, my wife is my kind of therapist. She's not involved in my business, but just kind of as a therapist. Yeah. But yeah, that's, I will never not have a, a business coach. At what point would you recommend, let's talk, let's say we're, we have someone who's listening into our conversation, who's maybe a, a year or two into their agency journey. At what point do you think it's important for them to, to reach out to one of these, maybe these, these agency groups or a consult business consultant or masterminds? Like at what point does that make sense for them? I would do as early as possible. Like I would, you know, I would do that instead of like paying myself and it doesn't have to be like, I, I have a one-on-one -on -one business coach. It's not cheap. So you don't have to start there, but like, you know, a, the cool part about like our world, like there's a lot of cool parts about our world today, but like 
we have access to so many different things. So yeah, maybe you're not paying, you know, 30 grand a year for, for a one-on-one -on -one business coach, but maybe it's, you know, $147 a month to join this program. Like the one my buddy Ryan runs down the street that you're in a group with a hundred other like-minded entrepreneurs. And, you know, maybe it's specific to running your agency or maybe it's not, maybe it's just other business owners that like have the same issues that are laying in bed at night thinking about the same things because we all go through the same things. So just that alone, in my experience, like just that alone, like talking with people that are going through the same things is very therapeutic yeah. because like, I think the loneliest part of business is when you're going through some challenges and you think that like, you're the only one that's going through these challenges. And it's like, why me? Why am I like, what am I, what's wrong with me? And that sort of thing. That's the worst. But then you realize like, you know, other people go through those things and you can help one another out. So I'd recommend, you know, as quickly as possible, yeah. even now, like there's free Facebook groups, like, you know, there's a lot of garbage out there. So you have to do some, you know, some vetting, but like there's free groups that you can join and, you know, you provide value, you get value in return. It's awesome. That's great. I've, I've been a member of various masterminds, either, either dad groups or business groups or, you know, uh, along the way. And I, I couldn't agree more. When it comes to the financials, when did you hire a CFO, a, a fractional CFO? And like, and why, why, what was happening in the business that caused you to realize, Hey, I need to do this. That was actually just uh man, probably six months ago. So it was one of those, I just, I didn't know that that, I didn't really know that existed. So that was like brought to my attention that there is a, a, you know, a fractional CFO service that is not a full-time employee that you can meet with a couple times a month. Like they do our books, they do our, we met with them today, actually we meet with them every two weeks. We go over our financial statements. And then we also like kind of project forward, like, you know, kind of budgeting and, you know, tax strategy and things like that. I just didn't know that that was a, a thing, even after 10 years in business. And now that's been, it's been awesome because now like it used to be just me in charge of like all the financials of the business, which is very typical for a business owner. And as a visionary, like I, I don't like the detailed stuff. Yeah. I like money of course, but like the, all the detailed stuff. Cause I'm always like, all right, if I'm doing this detailed stuff, my, my mind is somewhere else. I'm like, I could be shooting some more videos. I could be creating more content. I could be doing more marketing, which is re really like my sweet spot. So like, I would always like procrastinate on a little details. So now we have the CFO, we have Elizabeth, my, our COO, who is in charge of the P and L and the finances and all that. So we work together on that, which is awesome because like I was in my own way. <laughs> now we're able to make decisions based on the data in numerous areas of the company and not just like, oh yeah, I feel like things are going well. Let's, let's hire someone, you know, like now it's much more dialed in to the, to the dollars and cents. That's awesome. Now, again, like we had our meeting with our CFO today and afterwards, you know, Elizabeth and I were slacking and we have our, we have our same page meeting tomorrow. We have a same page meeting every week. And I was like, yeah, there's a couple of things that we, that they brought up today that I definitely want to talk about tomorrow. So just like anything else in business, as you know, Corey, like if you want to improve it, you got to put some time and energy into it. If yeah. not, it's never going yeah. to improve. So just by spending that time on your finances every week, couple hours, you know, it's all it takes. It, it just, you know, just improves it. Yeah. It improves everything. What's a, there's a, there's a principle around like, you know, what gets measured, gets managed and, and whatnot. And so, yeah, I mean, you have to, Peter Drucker, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what advice do you have for someone who's listening to us? Let's say on the agency side, or maybe they're interested in starting a training company, targeting a niche, like, but they haven't yet. Maybe they're more of a generalist. They're targeting kind of everyone, maybe in the local area or just anyone who would pay their, you know, hire them, but they're, struggling from the challenges of being a generalist, context switching, so on and so forth. But they're thinking about taking a vertical approach. What, what advice would you have for them as they're thinking through this decision? Yeah, that's, there's a lot that goes into that. One of my, actually that first mastermind I joined, it's called the Dynamite Circle. And the, the owner of that is Dan Andrews. And I think I'm still a member of that. I pay like the grandfather rate from back in like 2015. But Dan had this thing and I still remember it. He called it the onstage test. So if you're going to pick a vertical or pick a niche, you can't envision yourself on the stage of that industry's conference in five years. Like if that does not excite you, then find another vertical. So I think that's really important to, to like the vertical that you're in. Like if I were working with like, I, I, you know, something I don't like, like, I don't know, 
chiropractors or something like that. Yeah, stocks, b- bonds. <laughs> yeah, like, right. You just spoke bonds. You just... <laughs> Yeah, municipal bonds. I was 22 in that office. There were guys in that office that were 27 that were driving two cars that were taking limos to New York City for dinner, like on a Tuesday night, like balling. And I remember, like one of the one of the guys' names, Joe Rodriguez, uh, J Rod, like just baller at 27. And I was like, all right, I could stick, I could stick through this and do this for the next five years and hopefully be like him. I was like, that does not excite me. Like that, I, like he's still doing the same thing I'm doing. He's dialing for dollars every day. So yeah, it's gotta, it's gotta get you excited because man, it's hard. Like anything's hard, and life is short. We have one trip around, this, you know, uh, in this in this world. So you know, do something that that gets you excited. That's number one. Yeah, I mean the other, you know, practical things like you know, an industry that that's very you know addressable. You can identify the target addressable market. They have like a challenge. They have a pain point. The pain point's big. That's, that's, I think it's harder, you know, it's harder to sell something that, that people want than something they really need. And if they have that pain around like, man, I don't know how to do marketing, like market, like I hate marketing. I keep wasting money on it. And if you have like a new vehicle for them to help solve that issue, then, then that's awesome. You know, in addition to that, that, that networking group that I started, I, I called a bunch of people. Like I literally like Googled contractors in my local area and I called them and I was like, Hey dude, like my name's Joe. I'm starting this company to do some consulting and marketing for contractors. Like you mind giving me 10 minutes of your time? Tell me about like marketing and what questions you have or pain points. I have nothing to sell you. And I just did market research like that for a little while and just kind of gathered like, again, looking at the patterns. So yeah, try that. That is awesome. Great advice. Very actionable. I've got one more question for you. What's your motivation? I love people. I love helping people. Uh, Our purpose as a company and me individually is to equip people and companies with the tools to transform and grow. And so, you know, marketing is a vehicle for that. Roofing industry is great for that. But beyond that, like being on this, on this show, like, you know, equipping people with like different, you know, paradigm shifts or different mindsets or different tools that they can use to, to help them, you know, grow and, and, you know, fulfill their dreams and have the impact on their families. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's impact is big for me. I have a little mastermind called impact syndicate. So we get together a couple of times a month and talk about different topics, you know, whether it's family or time management or health and wellness you know, and how we can be the best versions of ourselves so we can have the biggest impact. So yeah, that's what motivates me. That's awesome. If there's listeners here who want to reach out to you, get, get involved, maybe learn more about the mastermind. That sounds very interesting, by the way. What's a, what's a good way to, for them to reach out to you? I'm excited. This is the first time I get to say this, Corey. I just launched our, uh, my, my own personal website, so it's josephhughes.co. Someone else, else had the dot com, so I had to sell the CO. <laughs> so yeah, that's just launched a couple weeks ago, and there's a bunch of stuff on there. Feel free to reach out and get in touch. I don't think anyone's, I haven't really publicized it yet, so I haven't gotten any like, you know, contact form submissions through that website. So I'm going to be excited when that first one comes Yeah, I'm going to have to ring the bell. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's gonna be like a telemarketer like hey man can you use, uh can you handle 30 leads a month yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome thank you so much joe for coming on it's been real great learning about your journey and you've been so generous with your experience and the learnings and lessons along the way and i think this has been a real high high value episode for the listeners so thank you so much for coming on thank you Corey. i appreciate it it's been uh it's been fun All right, folks, that's it for today. I'm Corey Quinn, and I hope you join me again next time for the Vertical Go-To-Market Podcast. If you receive value from the show, I would love a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.